Good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to everybody. I know there's a lot of folks online all over. And uh, my role today is to give you some information on our pediatric patients that have QR malformations as well as connective tissue hypermobility or an airless Danlos type of picture. I'm going to talk today about surgical indications, who's a surgical candidate, who's not a surgical candidate, and perhaps more importantly, what are the outcomes? So we have no financial conflicts of interest, and I think it's fair to say we really don't know an awful lot about the relation between EDS and Chiari, but as you just heard from Paolo and from many others, we know that there is certainly a much more involved relationship than just an x-ray finding, and I think as time goes on, we'll learn more and more and hopefully get some answers that we need. Uh, you're going to hear pediatric data today, and I think this may also apply to adults. Time will tell, and we are grateful for any uh, and for the support that we received in the past from ASAP. Uh, with some of the projects we work with. So the first thing you have to ask is what is a QRI malformation? And I'm sure everybody online and everybody's talking has their own particular personal view on this. But the bottom line is, is this a clinical condition or is it a radiographic finding? Does it change over time? Does it affect kids differently than adults? Um, sex, male versus female? You know, what is it? Or ultimately, is it really driven by the etiology? And of course, it raises many other questions. You know, what is the significance of the x-ray relative to the original definition? And of course, the natural history of uh, the not uncommonly found incidental QRs that we'll talk about later. What, of course, is the true pathogenesis? What's causing the tonsils to be below the frame and magnum? That's the ultimate question. And of course, what's the relationship with EDS? How do we best treat this? We still debate argument amongst the neurosurgeons and other folks out there. Do you do bone only? Do you do an open with the duroplasty? Do you stent the fourth? What about the tonsil and manipulation? Do you shrink the tonsils? Do you remove them? And again, probably best if you go back to the beginning, what's the probable etiology? And then, of course, in the long run, how do these patients actually do? You know, we have a lot of short-term studies, but long-term studies are critical. And what about failure? How do you diagnose failure? What does failure mean? And what do you do with that? So lots of questions, not a lot of time. Today's focus will uh, really revolve around an overview of our Chiari patients at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. over the last 16 years, and in particular, looking at the cohort of kids that had some type of ligamentous laxity or connective tissue hypermobility picture that's analogous to EDS, and how did that feed into this? What are the symptoms driven by the Chiari? What are the symptoms driven by the EDS? When is surgery appropriate and when is surgery not indicated? And again, everyone in the online recognizes there's always a balance between what's the benefit and what's the risk. And ultimately, how do these kids do relative to the other kids that don't have EDS? So back to the definition, important to recognize that this is a radiographic finding and it's only considered tonsils below five or more uh, millimeters below the frame of magnum. Uh, this all came from a paper uh, by Barkovich back in 1986. They looked at a couple hundred normal patients, looked at patients that carry patients, and if they took two standard deviations, that's where the number five came up. Those were patients beyond two standard deviations. Um, the other thing that's interesting is they're the ones that said it's probably to better to err on the side of a false positive diagnosis. Uh, certainly that was said before the error of EDS and other types of issues. I'm not so convinced that that's uh, applicable or true today. Now, everybody uh, online knows that the symptoms are very variable. They are age dependent. We've done a number of, work, uh, number of studies in this. Headache is certainly a principal feature. Uh, and again, we talk about headache, occipital, and so forth, but important. Neck pain, stiffness, paresthesias, numbness, weakness, trouble with balance, coordination, gait, uh, bowel and bladder challenges, and a whole bunch of other things, including fatigue and de decreased stamina. Now, on this slide, hopefully it projects well enough, you can see in the light green um, uh, test, those are all symptoms you see with EDS, and that's with patients that don't have a Chiari malformation. So, what's Chiari, what's EDS, and what's a mixture? And of course, these patients present with cervical uh, spine issues, they present with six nerve palsies, or may, I should say, apnea, numbness, weakness, spasticity, scoli. These are all things that everybody, I think, knows. So we've got lots of kids out there with headaches, dizziness, they're tired, they don't feel right, and a lot of kids out there with incidental Chiaris. We'll talk more about this uh, as well. And the real question is, when are they connected, or are they just separate phenomenon? And what is the significance of EDS in this setting? And what may be the 800-pound gorilla in the room here that we need to know more about is what's the role or what's the contribution from idiopathic intracranial hypertension, what we call pseudotumor. And we know that folks with EDS often have this. How is this uh, tying into so forth? 
So until you know the etiology, you're certainly not knowing how to fix the problem. When we look at etiology, I'm a keep it simple kind of guy. Uh, I look at a number of areas. The posterior fossa volume is too small. Well, that's easy. You make it bigger. You don't even have to even open the dura. And we've uh, actually published and showing the more that the space is enlarged, the better the patients do. Certainly for a majority of patients, there's an outflow obstruction to the spinal fluid at the frame of the magendi. And if the fluid can't get out, it finds other pathways and you can get a syrinx. Uh, but there's also a significant cohort in a large number of patients. I would argue between 10 and 15% of our patients that have some issue in the supratentorial, the top part of the head, whether they have pseudotumor or unrecognized hydrocephalus or even pansynostosis where these patients are um, having trouble with their growth plates in the skull and not letting their uh, brain grow enough. Uh, these are all reasons that have elevated pressure and not surprisingly, these are patients that end up with um, some element of, uh, of uh, tonsil herniation. And then of course today, we've got a lot of folks that have cranial cervical instability. Uh, and you know, you just heard from Paolo, you know, what is the significance of this? And these are the patients that have a lot of ligamentous laxity. So then what is the connection between EDS and Chiari malformation type one? We know there's lots more patients out there with EDS that are coming to our attention. We know there are lots of patients out there with Chiari uh, malformation that's found incidentally. Is there, is there a relationship? Are we just recognizing EDS uh, better or more frequently? Is the EDS contributing to the Chiari? Is the Chiari just a result of more EDS patients getting MRI scans? And again, what role does genetics play with this, uh, this overall association? So how often is Chiari found in the real world? How often do we have um, these incidental findings? <clears throat> Again, incidental Chiari would be tonsil herniation five or more millimeters below the frame of magnum with no symptoms, no history, no issue, found unexpectedly for workup for other things, car accidents, seizure workup, ADHD, and so forth. So again, this is, this is something whereby um, we didn't expect it. And there are a lot out there. The MRI use in the U.S., has quadrupled from 96 to 2010. Uh, it goes up 10, 15% a year. So everybody's getting an MRI scan. You can probably go to McDonald's now and get one as a drive-through. Uh, bottom line is the incidence is roughly 1%. And there's some studies that say it may even be higher, but 1% isn't a big percentage, but it's a big number when you consider all the patients out there getting scans. And we look at this roughly 50 kids a year are coming to our attention, the incidental carry malfunction. The question is, what do we do with this patient? What do we need to worry about and so forth? And we look at our series of well over 1,000 patients, more than half of these kids, 58%, have uh, an incidental curare malformation and so forth. And in the long term, about 8% of these patients go on to get into trouble, which means 92% do not. But uh, the bottom line is most of these patients stay stable, but they are out there, and then you got to figure out what's significant and what isn't significant. <clears throat> Now, what is an Ehrlos uh, Danlos syndrome? Patrice, can you hear me? Hi, this is Rebecca. We can hear you, yes. Okay, because I don't know, I don't have any feedback from my end, so I hope I wasn't talking to the wall here. Nope. Yeah. All right, so we're good. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I uh, just want to make sure you're, you're getting this. So, what is an Ehrlos Danlos syndrome? It's rare, it's a genetic kinetic tissue disorder with abnormal collagen synthesis. And uh, many terms out there, connective tissue hypermobility, ligamentous laxity, is this chronic fatigue disorder, fibromuscular dysplasia? There's a lot of possibilities in this. And I think it's fair to say it's not just one condition. It's relatively uncommon. One in 5,000 uh, folks out there have it. It's probably more than that. First described by Hippocrates in 400 BC. So it's been around for a while. Ehrlich and Danlos themselves did a better characterization of this in the early 1900s. And uh, Dr. Byton in South Africa uh, back in 1998, came up with six major subtypes. We know it's more nowadays, but the point is there are many common features with this, but there's also many variations on the theme. And so it may not be fair to call this one singular name, but the folks that have it know it. So common features include loose uh, joints, uh, hypermobile joints, frequently painful because they're overextending, loose skin. Uh, lots of patients, if not all of these patients, have some element, at least in the kids, of an autonomic dysfunction. They'll have partial orthostatic hypotension. They may have some element of irritable bowel syndrome. A lot of these folks have uh, urinary challenges with the urgency, frequency, even accidents, paresthesias, and easy bruising. And complications include aortic aneurysm and dissection, dislocated joints, scoliosis, immune disorders, frequently with mast cell issues, gastroparesis, and not uncommonly scoliosis.
So how does the existence of Ehlers Danlos apply to Chiari? And we see it not uncommonly, at least at our place, I see a couple of kids a week. And it's often scenarios where the symptoms for the patient are multiple, they're systemic, and they're often out of proportion to the radiographic findings that we see with the Chiari. And these are patients that may have mild or moderate degree of tonsil herniation. Uh, they may have a fair amount of room around the tonsils. And the challenge in this is to figure out, are the symptoms related to the EDS? Are they related to the Chiari or something in between? And again, a lot of you folks realize that there's lots of ways, manifestations, hyperextension, loose skin, the thumb to the forearm, and all so forth. And Byton came up with a system to score this with uh, both right and left sides to so getting a single point and a uh, total score of nine. And again, you can see passive range of the fifth uh, finger beyond 90 degrees, opposing the thumb to the volar aspect of the forearm, hyperextension of the elbow and knee beyond 10 degrees, and being able to place your hands flat on the floor without bending the knees. So the treatment is mostly supportive for these patients, pain control, physical therapy for core strengthening, hydration, sodium supplements, magnesium, question mark. A lot of people swear by it. I, I see a 50-50 response in this when I ask my patients. And then, in the, of course, we're going to talk about secondary surgery with respect to the Chiari. But these patients undergo joint reconstructions. Not uncommonly, they're in my office in a splint, a cast, on crutches, and even collecting for the patients that have significant gastroschisis. So we have 39 patients over 16 years here at Children's Hospital that we clearly felt were unquestionably uh, airless downloads patients. Uh, this is compared to 248 surgical patients at the same time they didn't have any manifestation of this, and we compared these patients overall. And it's fair to say there's probably a lot of other patients that had their Chiaris done that we didn't appreciate a long time ago. Well, first thing, when you look at the male versus female, 87% of the uh, airless downloads patients are female. Uh, versus 53% for the general cohort. And we've seen the same thing with the adults where the majority of the patients are, are ladies. So that's certainly different. Uh, when we look at our follow-up, general follow-up was 3.2 um, years. The EDS patients were 3.7 years. Statistically, not any different. Uh, when we look at the surgery and the indications of surgery, and we only operate on this for intractable, can't go to school, can't play sports, can't go to work, occipital slash neck pain or patients with neurological suggestion of uh, some type of compressor, or those with a legitimate degree of sphingomyelia, and not just a prominent central canal. And we look at the indications. Uh, headaches looks different, but uh, again, if you look statistically at this, headache, neurological change, sphingomyelia, both cohorts are for the most part in the same, uh, same category. And again, you've heard a lot today, and you'll hear and yesterday and more tomorrow um, definitive treatment is uh, for carry is generally surgical and there's various approaches, but the goal is to restore normal CSF flow dynamics as well as to minimize the formation of scarring and arachnoid adhesions, which could lead to recurrence. And there's lots of considerations. I'm not going to dig into this deeply because you've heard a lot and we'll hear more, but do you do it with bone only? Do you open the dura? Do a duraplasty? What about the interoperative imaging? Uh, we use ultrasound to try to define if we've relaxed or released this enough. What do you do with the tonsils? Do you need a fourth ring extent? And you heard Paulo's talk, what about fusion? When we look at the type of decompression, about half of our patients undergo a bone only, and the other half undergo some type of open exploration with duroplasty, and a significant percentage have a stent. Again, between the two cohorts, no difference. So generally, if you're looking at patients with EDS, the ones that are surgical candidates are those that have significant subjective complaints supported by a focused history and exam in the setting of a tight cranial cervical junction, whereas the symptoms are felt to be primarily related to the Chiari malformation. Yes, there's a lot of wiggle room there, and ultimately it comes down to you're in the trenches, you got to get a feeling, is this Chiari or this EDS? But you have to be careful. We have lots of EDS patients with sphingomyelia. That's obviously an indication for surgery. And those that have a true objective neurological deficit, whether it's apnea in a sleep study or six nerve palsy or whatever it may be. So a brief example is a 12-year-old young lady with a history of EDS, a Byton score of 8, plus 26-degree scoliosis, otherwise healthy, no pain, normal exam. And lo and behold, on her MRI, you'll see in a second, she has a large holocord syrinx. She has 16 millimeters of tonsil herniation and reasonable flow on her uh, study. Now, a couple of points here. This is 2010. We've learned a lot since 2010. It's 10 years. But back then, we weren't as clear cut on what to do with this. So we looked at her, we said, well, let's keep it simple. And although the tonsils look somewhat pointed, we said, why don't we just go ahead and do a bony uh, decompression? 
Uh, it seems to work for a large number of kids with syrinxes, and we'll see how you do. It's simple, it's safe, and so forth. We wouldn't say that today, but that's what we said back then. And you can see her syrinx, it's pronounced, there's no question. I know Paula's laughing, saying, I don't know why Keating just didn't do the real operation. But nevertheless, 11 months later, large syrinx, 20 months, and even, so it's not getting any better. She's still asymptomatic, she's still doing fine, but her scoliosis is worsening. The family's getting more and more concerned, appropriately so. And at that point, we said, you know, we really need to go back and explore. And we went back, and we could see, it doesn't project well here, lots of adhesions around the outflow of the CSF. And at that time, um, we felt she'd be better off with a stent. Here's the, the bone. The bone is still looking good. It hasn't regrown. She had some scar tissue on the uh, dura itself. When we opened the dura, lots of adhesions. No question why she still had the syrinx. The CSF can't circulate, can't get out beyond here. You go down the spinal cord. And lo and behold, we put a stent in to keep that open and, and give ourselves a benefit of the doubt. And then here we are, uh, six months post-op, it is smaller. And here we are, 18 months smaller, continue to get smaller over time. And we've gone from 26 to 16 degrees. So what do we learn from that? Well, the holocord syrinxes generally require an open exploration. Moderate size do not, not in our series. And that certainly those patients are at risk for that. Well, who's not a surgical candidate? And this is a tough thing, especially for kids that have been through all kinds of millions of appointments and disappointment. They've been told they're crazy. And it's a really a very, very hard uh, scenario for a real condition that's uh, just devastating for the patients and their families. Well, patients that have subjected complaints that are disproportionate to their x-ray, to their MRI, especially if they've got rounded tonsils, lots of space and room, it's a good chance that their headaches or their issues are not related to the Chiari. Lack of objective or reproducible findings. You examine the patient, and in Timmons, you examine they have a different finding, uh, would make you suspicious that that's really going to get better. And then, if you really feel at the end of the day your symptoms are more likely to be related to your connective tissue problems than they are to your Chiari, they're not a surgical candidate. I think you know the risks of doing a Chiari decompression, and you can define those, but I think the bigger risk is the psychological component. You go through all of this, the kids go through a rough time, the families do too, and at the end of the day, they're no better, and God forbid they're worse. And this is to give you a brief example that we just did yesterday. This is how common we see this stuff to show you how complex these patients can be. It's an eight-year-old girl, long-standing history of EDS, Chiari malformation, lots of issues, she comes in with a decreased vision in the right eye. There's no obvious papilledema. There's some debate if she has a drusens, whether there's an issue or not with her optic fundi. She does have some headaches. She kind of sore everywhere. Her exam is normal neurologically, and she's got a bite and score. I say greater than eight. It's eight. Um, big time history of uh, EDS and Chiari and whatnot. And she'd been worked up five years ago for similar issues at the age of three and a half and underwent a spinal tap with a pressure of 21 borderline high, went on some an ICP model with a pressure between 10 and 28. Again, not very exciting. Everybody sat back and said, okay, we're going to just watch you. But now she's back. And yes, her tonsils are not exactly the most rounded tonsils you've seen, but they're not super tight. There's room. She's got some modest pseudobasmin vagination. There's no syrinx. But she does have on a CT scan moderate ventricular megaly which hasn't changed. This is the new one on the left. It's really the same. She's got a lot of white uh, matter issues. But the question was, how much of this is being related to pressure, and was she at risk for some type of pseudotumor or analogous scenario? So we took her to the OR yesterday for a drain, figured that the, the risk uh, from the drain was less than the benefits, and lo and behold, in the operating room, we had an opening pressure greater or close in the 20s, which is not normal with sleep, huge pulse differential. And now the question is, does she need a shunt, an endoscopic ventriculostomy, or just a trial of Diamox? So we're trying to figure that out, but the point of this is, a Chiari decompression is not going to make her better. It's really the tip of the iceberg, and it's probably being driven from supertentorial pressure. So how do these patients do? Um, well, if you look at the outcomes, 90% of the patients in both group were better with respect to the headaches. Um, 84 and 74% were better with respect to their uh, syrinx and neurological stuff, although it looks like there's a difference. The numbers were small. There's no difference between improvement for neurological change as well. So both EDS patients and regular general patients did not have any difference in outcomes, and the, really the minute the complications are the low single digits for both groups. So what about failure? When we look at all of our patients overall over 16 years, it's just shy of 10%. If we look at the airless Danlos patients, it's 10.5%. I would argue statistically there's no difference here, and I would argue actually our rate is less. 
it's hard to define failure. There's not a lot written on it. Are you measuring subjective or objective issues? So failure is always a challenge. Certainly coming back for another operation is a sign of failure. And when we looked at our failure patients, when we looked at the patients that had bone only, we never went inside the dura, 20% had inadequate bone work, but 80% had scarring at the outflow. And you're going to say, well, that's not a surprise. You should have been there in the first place. Probably true. But it's interesting. And the other patients that actually had a duraplasty and so forth, all of them had arachnoid scars despite someone having been there before and so forth. And it raises the question, what is the role of tonsil manipulation, of, of coagulating, of bipolar? Is it evil? Does it add to increased failure? And there's data that goes both ways. But I would argue or ask you, does it make sense to potentially create more scarring or adhesions at the craniocervical choke point for CSF? So very briefly, we looked at a time frame where we did almost all of our patients got tonsil or uh, cautery before 2008. And afterwards, we tried to minimize this. And we found that our reoperation rate was 13% in the prior time frame, only 5% in the later. We found that patients that had the earlier surgery had tonsillar coagulation 75% of the time and only 42% in the later group. And we looked at the patients that had some type of tonsillar manipulation, 24% uh, had a redo or failure and only 9% of those that didn't. We're still working on getting more data. We want to make that a little more solid. But I would argue if you don't need to touch the tonsils, I wouldn't touch them. So to conclude, no question EDS patients more frequently are, are ladies or young ladies, 87%, definitely significant. Our follow-up period was very similar for the two groups. The average age of presentation, I didn't mention this before, was slightly longer. They presented at 10.73 years. They had surged at 13.63 years for the EDS kids. Longer than the other ones, it's a little bit significant. It was 0.05 or 0.07 but suspect this is related to it's harder getting x-rays back in the old days if you had all kinds of somatic complaints, not so today. The surgical approaches were similar for both groups, so we didn't do anything dramatically different for the EDS kids that we did for the other kids, and that the indications for surgery and the outcomes of surgery was statistically the same for both cohorts. So to conclude, the pathogenesis is still controversial, but you need to say to yourself, is this a clinical picture or a radiographic diagnosis? You need to really think about the probable pathogenesis, what's causing those tonsils to be lower than they should be, and then that's what you pursue, especially in the setting of EDS. And when you look at the literature, 80 to 90 percent of the patients do better, and the symptoms or syrinxes after surgery, our numbers are similar to that, and I would argue that between our two groups, there is no difference. Uh, we know when we debate closed versus open, bone only versus duraplasty, uh, for a large number of patients, we don't see a difference, but for the Kids that have the whole accord syrinx, where there was less patients showing change, those patients invariably need to have the dura open. So what have we learned from this, or what have I learned from this? You need to have realistic expectations on the surgeon's side and the family side. Uh, you may improve the carry issues. You usually do improve the carry issues, but there's often no significant change in the systemic uh, component of their um, EDS, and you need to make that very clear on many cases of the patient and the family. It's a critical, it's important to differentiate what's EDS and what's Chiari, and of course, it's not always easy. It, these patients invariably get better, but it often takes them a longer period of time, sometimes even up to twice as long as the other kids. Treat the patient, not the x-ray, and every patient, as everyone online here knows, is their own textbook. Future directions, we need to understand the physiology and the hydrodynamic factors better to really understand this well. We need to get a better idea what the natural history is. We're actually finishing our paper on almost 20 years of data on this for the kids with insular Chiari malformations. Uh, the genetic part of this is huge. As we know, patients with Chiari have a higher genetic predisposition and as well as EDS. And I think in the end, we're gonna need to figure out which patients need bone only, which don't need that, and stratify that to reduce the risks overall. So I'm gonna stop there and, and hopefully uh, I'm available for questions if anything's out there. Thank you.